Is it started? It's one o'clock. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us. So while we are going through getting this presentation set up, we're going to launch a quick poll and let everybody sign in. Again, thank you for taking time out of the busy day. I know lots going on in the world, so uh, we appreciate you considering us for your attention during this. So uh, let me launch this poll and then we will get this thing underway. All right, so um, what screen am I on here? Jared, I believe uh, I'm looking at uh, the presentation up in front of me on this one right now. Um, so while we're going through this today, we're, we're going over the future of air sealing. So how, how the industry has changed, what is happening, what is going on in the market, um, a lot of things around codes, a lot of things around health, a lot of concerns on how COVID has impacted a lot of scheduling, um, really just how we can innovate and move forward and air sealing being at the heart of a lot of these high performance homes and just construction in general. So today we're gonna go over what we're considering the future of air sealing. Um, inherent to the company, we believe we are the future. Um, so Aero Barrier is going to, to fit and uh, compensate and basically overcome a lot of these challenges that traditional methods uh, struggle through. So we're gonna go through, uh, again, what, what those differences are and a little housekeeping, this recording is happening live. So as we're going through, um, feel free, ask your questions, but know that about an hour, two hours after this, the recording will be pushed out. So anybody that's on the call, anybody that may fall off, things along those lines, um, there will be a recording that's sent out automatically. Uh, again, use the question functionality throughout. We are gonna try to go through, there's a lot of great content here today. Um, so we're gonna try to hold off questions towards the end, uh, but know that that functionality is there. And then we'll have a short survey towards the end uh, that we would love for you guys to fill out just to give us a little feedback on how we're doing and uh, get the ball rolling. So um, today we're joined uh, by Scott and Jared. So a little background, these are two representatives for the sales element of Aero Barrier. So Scott joins us from uh, Canada and then Jared in the US. Um, Scott, would you like to give a little background on yourself? I would. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. 
Blake. So yeah, I'm Scott Stevens. I'm with the Aero Barrier Canada. I, uh, with a couple of my partners, brought Aero Barrier to Canada two years ago, and it all, uh, interestingly enough, started a conversation at lunch in uh, Barcelona, Spain, uh, three years ago with Gord Cook. I'm not sure if everybody knows Gord Cook, but Gord Cook, a building scientist, uh, uh, showed me this product, and you know, we got a, a group of people together to bring that to Canada. It's going exceedingly well. Uh, we're really enjoying it. Uh, geographically, I just want to let everybody know I'm in the Toronto area. Area, and that would be home to the Toronto Raptors, which would be the uh, champion still of the last real season. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. And we got some really exciting stuff to talk about uh, today. Talk about the benefits of, of Aero Bear and how that works uh, kind of for the, for the builders and also the opportunities for dealers. I'll turn it over to you, Jared. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So, uh, Jared Scott, I am based out of uh, Dayton, Ohio. That's where Aero Seal LLC, the parent company of uh, aero seal duct sealing and aero barrier uh, envelope sealing is is located. So I'm, I come to the company. It's a it's a strange story, but um, having a friend that worked here and uh, I saw an episode uh, of the product on this old house and it prompted a phone call and then another couple of phone calls and and landed me here. So uh, I just love the technology, love what it can do and how it helps uh, contractors and builders and you know, and homeowners uh, achieve really what they're what they're looking for. So we'll talk more about that uh, as we go. Great. So I'm gonna quickly go through the agenda. Um, Jared, I don't believe your screen is sharing right now. Um, so as I'm going through, so today some of the items we're gonna touch on are, you know, why is air sealing important? I think a lot of us on the call understand it, but just to reiterate what the importance of it is. Uh, what some of those challenges of traditional methods uh, we're facing and everything out in the market, you know, spray foams are out there, caulks are out there, you name it. There's very various vapor barriers and air barriers, uh, how aero barrier specifically overcomes many of those challenges, and then how to go about getting started with it. And like I said, a little Q&A at the end, and uh, just to share out some poll results for Scott and Jared on the line. So based on the poll, we, uh, we have a nice little split here. So we got about 22% energy raters, 10% insulation contractors, 27% builders, 10% in the engineering and architect, and then 33 in the other category. So All right. without further ado, I will pass this over to Jared Scott. All right, well, thank you, I appreciate that. That's a really good mix too, uh, by the way, and contractors. So hopefully, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna address everything um, uh, generally and, and hopefully how it applies. Uh, keep in mind specifics around uh, your role. Uh, there's the Q&A session, and then also at the end of this, uh, you know, we're we're happy to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, call and and uh, meeting with you. So, uh, just talking real quickly, you know, why is air sealing important? Um, we think it's pretty simple. It's arguably one of the uh, the single greatest impacts to any build, right? So that when it comes uh, comes to that uh, that aspect, there's a lot of data that that's come from a number of different studies, and all of which point to air leakage is really the single biggest component uh, of impact on energy savings and achieving good, healthy air in the living space. So these are the things that are often driving the progression of building codes, as well as the high performance homes and you know that are including energy star, passive home, net zero, and other advanced energy targeted builds. And the important thing to note is that it doesn't matter what the build type is, uh, if it's just meeting, a, and I don't say just meeting because some uh, codes are, are difficult, but if it's meeting that code or if it is meeting those, those much higher and stringent efficiency uh, targets, the key component here is going to be ensuring that the, uh, the home is treated as a complete system and that being uh, eliminating that leakage. So we're talking here about, uh, about what the codes are and, and um, uh, I'm interested, you know, at, at the end, if, if you guys want to throw out uh, where you're located and, and some of that to help us understand the, the, what you're up against. But we know that the codes are first and foremost, uh, the air tightness verification is going to is going to be a, re a requirement, right? So the U.S. has upcoming 2021 IECC revisions, and um, uh, if if you're not there, the progression is going in that in that direction. So more and more states are going to be moving towards that three ACH. 50 uh, mark, as well as commercial buildings uh, having the air type testing uh, mandatory there too. And uh, I won't talk to it too much here. I'll let uh, Scott do that in a minute. But Canada has been practicing, you know, this for for some time and, and achieving that 2.5 ACH. 
So some of the um, uh, implications here, failing in, in the rework creates that lost opportunity, costing you more, you know, instead of the upfront labor uh, resource and, and the draw there, reworking it is obviously gonna cost you more. So it costs you the, the labor aspect, it can cost you the material aspect, cost of recertification and additional tests, and then obviously the missed revenue opportunity from being able to do additional projects that the crew would, would normally be on if they didn't have to go back and rework it. So that's a big uh, big reason where we're, you know, when we talk about this and we'll, we'll get into the process a little bit more, and uh, I think you'll see where uh, Aero Barrier fits. So here's a, uh, just the U.S. map uh, sharing that, um, obviously that's, uh, if it's a zero energy ready, uh, Energy Star, 2012 IACC or Passive House, you can see the climate zones and, and where those requirements fall. We don't really get into this too much, but we know that, that uh, if you're not there, it is going to be uh, creeping towards that 3ACH50 uh, level. Great. Uh, thanks, Jared. Uh, and just uh, you saw those numbers there from uh, Jared's slide. You know, kind of the goal in the future is to get uh, to that passive, that 0.6 or even a, a net zero, uh, which we call it in Canada. You guys call it, I think, uh, energy uh, net zero. How's that work? Uh, right. A little bit different. But uh, Canada has always been a leader in building, particularly in residential building. We came out with the R2000 program in the 70s, so it's always been on our minds and for good reason. Uh, you know, the, the climate here is typically colder in most most regions. So even our building code in, in Section 9, you can see here that it talks about having a continuous air barrier. So we've been talking about it for a while. So it is in, in the code. Can you give me the next slide there, Jared? I don't have uh, that functionality right now. Yep. And so we have a steps towards net zero and this is really really important there's that this 2032 mark so we're, we're coming up into you know just just over a decade where we want to see 15 to 20 percent improvements in the code and standards over the next 10 uh, 20 years and we'll probably always want to see that and so you can see this ladder here in canada where you know we're bringing in a, our standard here of this energy uh, rating system of 80. we go up in canada i know it goes down the scale goes down uh, in the us so just uh, remember keep that in mind energy star right now has many levels to it and right now we're at approximately using air, air changes per hour two and a half uh, air changes per hour and um when we go to r2000 which is the next step up but there's also an energy Energy star level that it gets to one and a half air changes per hour and so we have in Canada taken some steps to get to tighter structures and what we're seeing here is one and a half with builders it's it's challenged to get there so we can comfortably get to 1.8 1.7 with traditional methods but it becomes logarithmic so to get to that 1.5 and lower becomes more challenging and this is where arrow barrier, arrow barrier helps a ton and then you can see as we go uh, up the ladder we're getting to different levels of net zero which is going to get us well be uh, below 1.5 and ultimately uh, below one and this is on new builds track type of housing so we have um, up in Canada we definitely have a strong mandate to have uh, tighter houses next slide please and so British Columbia has been the first to adopt and they call it the step code and you can see up here in the top right hand corner 2032 this is the uh, the target date and you can see they've put in these different levels and each of these different levels um, give, comes with a different air tightness and it always as Jared said earlier starts with air tightness um, if you talk to builders you, you can't model or, or optimize a home's um, uh, um, a design unless you start with the air change product because so elusive and up until now we have not been able to dial it in i remember when i first started talking to builders a couple of years ago one they don't really know what their their air barrier is so that's that's the start the many on a site where i've seen two two site supers they both give me different answers so this is there's some education that's going on there as well so there's an opportunity to become an expert on on site so so we we, we start right there and then we say let's model this home now for whatever air tightness you want. In the US, it could be, you know, let's model for three. Now we can model and optimize for, for three. In Canada, we might want to model and optimize for one and a half, and in different areas, uh, it could be one, or if we want to do passive, it could be 0.6. The key is now, when we get up here to step five with aero barrier, it's dialed in. You don't have to worry about it. Next slide, please. So the path to net zero, um, this, is, this is what it is. It is cheaper to save a watt than it is to make a watt. 
So we start right here with improving the envelope, and that's where arrow barrier um, it, it comes into play. The other two are resizing your mechanicals and then getting into renewable uh, energy sources. So as I see it, if you're if you're a dealer, you're an insulator, you're a contractor, you know you can be the expert in improving the envelope, and you can also take other opportunities to round out your business and re, you know, become a mechanical a mechanical expert, or you can get into renewables. And um, you know this is that I was talking about earlier. This the hurdle is air leakage. GTA stands for Greater Toronto Area. Sorry, I should have written that out. Um, you know, builders see themselves getting into two ACH 50 very comfortably in traditional methods. But once you go a little bit below that, it becomes a little more, more challenging. And again, that's where aero barrier helps out. So next slide, please. Okay. So what we know, we know this, we know that moisture travels with air. So if we can stop the air movement, we can stop the moisture. Uh, movement. Why is that important? Well, we know that because building houses and structures, it's all about moisture management. We're always just trying to wick the water away. We're trying to not let the vapor in because that's what wrecks houses. We, If you're in the building industry, I don't even have to say it or repeat it, probably will, but we we always have to take care of the uh, manage the moisture and the water. So uncontrolled air leakage accounts for 40% of winter energy use. Can you imagine that? That's just that's just air leakage. Now you have an opportunity to control it. Air leakage introduces moisture, noise, pollutants. Um, you know, and air it varies dramatically hour by hour, day by day, depending on on the pressure, season season to season. We'll go to the next one. So air leakage, this is a, a one inch square hole. It will transfer 30 liters of water. So you've got this now this flow in the heating season of water moving through your air barrier. And now you're gonna have this higher moisture content, uh, colder temperature, meaning a warm temperature. We all know what happens. Now we get condensation. Ultimately, we get uh, a problem with the structure. We're gonna we're gonna deteriorate the structure. So, um, so the air barrier is far more important than the vapor retarders. In fact, many U.S. states, and we're trying to work it out up here, is to kind of get rid of the poly on the on the vapor side and just tighten it up because we know air and and moisture move together. Next slide. So here's that, go back to what we talked about earlier. Air leakage is the most significant factor when it comes to heat loss, particularly winter heat loss. So you can look and see on these, these pie charts, you know, that air leakage is 30%. So, wow, now just dial it in. We know what we can get um, on, a, on a code. There's a code 20. 12, energy stars, 25%, get to R2000, now you're getting tighter, it's 15%, but there's the huge impact um, with air leakage. Next slide. So the benefits of reduced leakage, we've been talking about it. There's an experience, uh, dramatic savings on the homes, heating and cooling. So we see immediate savings. Um, you know, we enjoy a more comfortable home. And when I look at trade-offs, you know, being more consistent room to room, um, feeling warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, I think that's a huge, a huge benefit to the occupant, so to the consumer. And that as a, as a builder, you look at trade-offs, particularly in Ontario, uh, what would we have more benefit? taking out uh, like a, a drain water heat recovery or or improving the air tightness. Well, we'd rather take out the drain water heat recovery because consumers don't feel that benefit. But I can tell you this, in the winter, they can feel a cold room. So we want to prevent those, those drafts. And preventing moisture from entering the wall system. You know, we all know what we talked about, moisture ruins houses. So that's one thing that we can do is reduce the air leakage, reduce the moisture leakage, improve the, uh, um, the the wall system diminish outside outside noise you know we we know that noise travels through holes it's opening so we, we uh, by reducing the uh, air leakage we reduce the noise as well defend against insects and pests I remember three years ago I was telling my sister about this and she goes I'd have less ants in my house I yeah I gave her a price she said I'd do that in a heartbeat you know, so, and she lives in a new house. She actually lives in a very new house, which is fairly tight. I think it's about three air changes per hour. And she still gets some, some ants. She'd be happy, well, she wouldn't be happy. I'm telling everybody this, but she would be happy to uh, to uh, seal up those small holes. And I'm gonna show you a little bit later on the size of the holes, like we, actual pictures I've taken off some job sites that I can show you what we're sealing here. So, and then improve indoor air quality. So uh, next slide, please. So it's gonna help, you know, seal out the pollutants uh, 
and, and allergens. And uh, in terms of that indoor air quality, it's big in my life. I spent 30 years selling uh, HRV and, and ERV, and I'm really of the belief of, you know, it sees right, right down there, I'm going to skip to the bottom, you know, kind of make it tight and ventilate it right. You know, <laughs> I, I say to people all the time, they ask me, you know, about HRVs or ERVs, and, and it's much bigger in Canada than it is in the U.S. I know in the snow belt and some of the other areas we, we see ERVs, but it's it's great to build it tight, but then we also have to uh, ventilate it right as well. I say to people all the time, I said, would you live in a body without lungs? And I, we don't have to put up a survey because I know what the answer is. Not many of us want to do that. So it's, it's really, really um, critical that we look at the house as a system, right? Because of all the things that we talked about, that less vapor diffusion, uh, less transportation of air pollutants uh, kind of in and out, energy, better performance, more comfortable, and then codes. Um, I don't know a lot of things uh, in this world. I can't forecast a lot of things. Probably not going to be able to forecast even the last four states of the election right now, but I can forecast this. The one thing I can forecast is that houses in North America are going to get tighter, not looser. And that's a fact. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, I like it. Uh, if I can just jump on, I, I really like that that top line, the codes and the code enforces it, energy impact drives it. And the health of the building uh, requires, and actually the inhabitants, uh, the health of the inhabitants uh, there too. And, and you couldn't have said it better, you know, the, uh, and with a lung analogy. So we'll talk here with, uh, you know, some of the variables that are, uh, uh, that you have in, in trying to tighten up the building envelope. If you ask the question, Scott, like you said earlier, who's responsible for maintaining the integrity of the building envelope? And ask that question. It's, it's, it's a great question, but the answers are often not very reassuring to the overall goal. So, uh, you know, what we'll we'll talk about here, and you'll see in the process where uh, Aero Barrier sort of resolves that uh, with having, um, you know, whoever that is that's doing that work, uh, it's going to uh, alleviate that, uh, that concern. Um, and here we go, some challenges of the traditional methods. These are some pictures of, uh, you know, real real job sites here. Uh, the left image is the fire rated foam being used as an air barrier. You know, this is kind of equates to the misuse of a product, wasted time, wasted material here. Um, sure, can it can it do it? Uh, yeah, it can it can perform uh, that way. Um, just not really what it was intended for. So, um, and a lot of wasted material. Same thing on the right there. It's a much cleaner look, uh, but still wasted material on time. Uh, in this case, I, I believe it was a $3,200 cost for for some results that were not ideal, and uh, they realized later that it could have been done uh, for uh, for much less than that by targeting the leakage instead of guessing. And here's more pictures. Uh, we've got some poor execution and inconsistent on uh, on the left here, right? So you can see the attempt uh, to seal. Um, actually, all the way across uh, with waste of materials and waste of time, and really the, the the big component here around the challenge is the human element. And you can hire, you know, uh, some some great craftsmen, uh, you know, that would go in and and uh, and seal and and tighten it up. Problem is, is that uh, you know you still have, in a lot of cases, you have other trades affecting that. Uh, so. Um, all of these being uh, the best attempt, uh, and we certainly certainly admire that. But with Aero Barrier, it's going to remove that human element. It's going to put a building science approach behind it, and um, and we'll share that process with you here in a minute. Uh, so even spray foam has some inconsistencies. It's it's going to be a, it's going to work as effectively and as well as uh, the uh, the person that is that is spraying it. So. You know, it's not sealed on the uh, bottom plates and the rim joist. Um, again, great product, but it, it's, it can be expensive and it can be, uh, in some cases, a waste. And once this is covered up, it's going to be extremely hard to, to get back in there. Jared? Yeah. I just said uh, quickly add these these two pictures here. Uh, the comparison here is, you know, this is a this is a spray foam job on the on the left hand side that is a, just a bad spray foam job. Should not have been happened. I think it was all applied at one time. But uh, generally yeah. speaking, you know, I've been on a lot of job sites. We don't see a lot of that for our insulators on the phone. This was right. used uh, in another presentation to show you know bad uh, spray foam. Sure. Uh, I can tell you this though, if we were on a job and that did happen, uh, this is, has such a diagnostic capability, we'd find it right away prior to ha it being sealed up. So. Thank you. Sure, great point. 
All right, so summarizing these points again here, uh, you've got the inconsistent results, you know, only being able to see what you can reach. Often, a, a lot of the leaks are apparent, they're not accessible, or they're so small uh, that, and, and when combined, they accumulate to a much larger uh, leakage issue. But the time and labor intensive, the chasing leaks is, is very inefficient. The material waste, uh, we also here around uh, the COVID situation has created some scheduling challenges. I don't know if that's everywhere, obviously, but in some, some areas where there's a limitation to how many uh, actual workers can be on the job site. Um, so a little schedule challenge there. Uh, use of some unhealthy uh, materials, uh, high in VOCs, off-gassing, uh, the need for uh, special suits or ventilators. Uh, that both impacts the short term with workers during the project and, and possibly the longer term with the homeowner uh, that's living inside of the space. Uh, and then the traditional methods that are suited for rough-in, those can become costly to resolve once the finished surface surfaces are in place. And that's where I was, you know, again, to Scott's point, hopefully that, that, that spray foam uh, the picture on the left doesn't, doesn't get covered up. Uh, and no doubt somebody would, uh, correct it, but if it does, then you've got a you've got a leakage issue, and it's going to be rather costly to fix. All right, so with um, dialing in the optimization part that uh, Scott touched on a little bit, error barrier is going to be that convenient, cost-effective approach that's going to seal homes in less than three hours and provide that verification of what was accomplished there. So it does change the way that homes are going to be built. This is going to provide a consistent tighter building envelope, it's verified, it's predictable, and it gives documented results. It's a single process, and it's gonna be a, a huge time savings. So again, those, those three things are very consistent, very uh, certified and verified results in a single process. It's a huge benefit. This video will describe the process. And then we'll get into that a little bit.
All right. So we'll dig in. Uh, I'll pass this off to Scott here. We'll dig in on the uh, some of those uh, process steps a little bit deeper. Great. Thanks, Jared. And I had trouble with the sound. I'm not sure if everybody else did, but that video, oh. video is available on online on, on YouTube, but we can also send it out if you, you know, put your name in the chat bar as well. Absolutely. But the process, um, I, I know, uh, I'm not sure how many people have seen the process, um, maybe by a show of hands, it looks like a few have. So energy raters know this, uh, builders who test their houses will know this. They have um, a blower door test that is conducted. And that blower door test is actually done by uh, exhaling the house. So it's move, pulling air out of the house and we're trying to measure how much leakage there is under 50 pascals. The aero barrier process is the opposite. What we're doing is we are pressurizing the house. So we're taking the blower door fan, we're basically turning around and we're going to pressurize it at 100 pascals, twice that that we would do a blower door test at. So when that happens, the structure starts to leak that air just wants to escape so we what we do then is we go in just before we we get that all set up we cover any horizontal surfaces to protect anything that the consumer may interact with after so if there are any finished floors or any fin like window ledges anything that the material that's going to dry fall that's material that doesn't find a hole is going to dry fall to a horizontal surface it does not stick to a vertical surface there's so much pressure on the house that it just sits in the air and goes for a hole once that gets to the hole the velocity picks up it coagulates and it fills up that that hole we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second and then um that that would be the process of sealing we're pressurizing a house and you can see in this middle picture that we start to mist in and that's what you saw in the video so we start to mist in these atomized particles and these are the particles that the airflow paths as they're trying to escape the structure they carry these atomized uh particle particles along and they deposit the seal and they coagulate uh, creating that air tightness and um, the video Jared had mentioned it the software regulates the entire process so you just basically are controlling the parameters within the house you're monitoring the ceiling uh, everything is done from the outside there's nobody inside and all the way along you can see go to the next slide please uh, Jared you can sure. see the results and you can see how the structure is getting tighter one of the questions we we get a lot of you know kind of is this new where did this come from uh that, that those sorts of questions and they're great questions and you know this is not a new it's not new it's a repurposed uh process it started with aero seal many of you would know that this is a duct sealing um uh technology that we have that was developed in 1994 at the university of uh, berkeley in their laboratories by dr mark madera and so as I said, everybody, this is not uh, created in Jimmy's garage. It's, it's, the, it's the real thing. It has the proper approvals that you can see here, the STM 2178, the E84 for smoke flame shred, S101 in Canada. Uh, you know, it has the, the CDPH from, from California. It's Green Guard Gold certified. 70% of it is water. So there are no... Uh, uh, off, there's no off casting so ultra low VOCs it's inert it's an organic compound it's um, it, it UL and it's national green belt stand uh, um, standard certified product and it seals up to half an inch and down to the size of human hair and this is going to be important think remember that because I'm going to bring that up in a, in a slide a, a couple of slides from now uh, and it's stress tested up to 40 years with no signs of, of degradation when I sent the SDS uh, reports off to an engineer here in Ontario uh, one who is uh, who's very fastidious and uh, I sent him off and within a minute he sent back and his entire email was wow because there is no off gas. It's a very friendly um, uh, sealant that's made by a major manufacturer to our specification. So next slide, please. And we just run the machine until that ACH, that air change uh, per hour goal is met. So it's really nice. This is where all those advantages of being able to model the house in advance because we know what that air change level is going to be. The toughest part of building and that air changes, uh, we've got it dialed in. So next slide, please. And you can see, here's the, so I'm going to show you some before and after shots. This is a nice uh, uh, box. You can see on the left-hand side, the hole between the drywall and the box. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side how it's filled in just automatically, like a cock. Like it's the perfect bead of caulking on there. And more importantly, I wanted to look in the top left inside the box. You can see there's a little wee square that goes to the outside. And look at how beautiful that bead of caulking is on that hole. So the air was escaping through there under pressurization. It pulled some sealant along with it. 
and then it coagulates right on right where the hole is to the outside so next shot and here are some some other uh shots that we see like you know you can see i kind of on on the, the foam here miss the foam we can see it kind of picking up on the side uh just around this this fitting here around any anywhere there's leakage you will see the sealant will start to to move around you can just look through some of those uh, uh pictures these are these are not seen by the naked you're not going to know what's going to leak what's not going to leak but air escaping will uh self-guided and will will find the holes on its own next slide please so uh, this so I, I was doing a job and uh we just put it all up there this blue outside blue area represents the surface area of a house so surface area back one place the surface area of a house is the the um walls ceiling floor separated the inside from the outside and so we started this house it was 2.6 air changes per hour um, and then it has an approximate uh, surface uh, area of 7,000 square feet and a 3,000 square foot house. So imagine that it's a 3,000 square foot house, it's a 7,000 uh, square feet of surface area. The total amount, if we collected all of the sealant that was left in the house, it was one square foot. And with that one square foot of material, we brought it down to 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So the reason I want to show you that is here representing in blue the entire house of surface area and this little dot right in the middle this black dot is the collected amount of material that was left of friendly low VOC material that was left in the house that took us from 2.6 down to 0.6 which is spectacular. There's no other way to do that. Next slide please. That's a really good visual. So what did we seal? And this is, you know how some people say, um, you know, a picture's a thousand words. I took this picture myself. I'm going to take a thousand words probably to explain it. I apologize for that. So this is, I was so excited when I took the picture. This is the middle hinge of an exterior door. And this is the frame of the door. And then if you keep going to the right, this is the shim pack uh, and quite a shim pack on there. So if you see this white material between the shims, that's arrow barrier. These are the size of holes, real holes that we're sealing up, that the, the system is finding. And here, I want to take you to the bottom. You can see this cobweb down at the bottom of the picture and look underneath the cobweb and see the sealant there. The, the, it's so it's self-guided, it's non-intrusive. The air is being blown out through that hole and it goes under the cobweb, takes the atomized particles and puts it into the, into the uh, uh, shim. If you looked at that with the naked eye before, there's no way you would know which one, which part of that shim pack was, what was uh, leaking, but the, the escaping air finds it. Next, please. So I want to give you a little experience that we had in, in Toronto with a, he's a passive architect. He buys these old houses and he, he actually 1942 semi and he took this one and he was trying to make it passive. When he bought it, it started at 9.81 air changes per hour. They did some, you know, kind of large work, you know, insulation, put, started putting the arrow barrier, did some foaming, but real nice job. They got it down to 6.1. Then they started to get serious and you can see the dates here 123 19 and then they got serious and then they started going after some bigger holes that were, were missed in their uh, initial um installation and so they got it down to 2.96 now they worked a little bit more and they got it down to 2.43 so you know i talked to him a couple of times you can do error berry no 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 I, he's trying to hold off he's give me a little bit more time so i i call him on uh, this day it's in the morning of uh, February 7th, and it's 1.62. This is done by an energy raider in Toronto, very qualified energy radiator, raider. And he goes, okay, uh, 1.62, uh, we're gonna work at it all day. They got three guys, so they're gonna spend now three guys, eight hours, and they're gonna try to get it down to passive, which is 0.6, which Jared told, showed you earlier. They worked all day. I called him around dinner time. I said, so how'd it go? He goes, well, uh, Austin tested, it was 1.61. Three guys worked all day. They got it. They, they did a nice job. They got it from 1.62 to 1.61. So I said, are we doing it? He goes, yeah, come in a couple of days. So we come in a couple of days and it was a wintry day up here in, in Canada. This is right in the middle of the city. So, you know, we, we set up a, a little uh, a tent out there um, and we started, you know, doing all the arrow bearer things and uh, we ended up at the end of the day we ended up at 0.34 ACH 50 and really it was all set up nobody's in the house 
uh, and we started started sealing. Go to the next one. We basically did this. We we kind of stayed and ate Portuguese donuts and and drank coffee. Well, we just keep going, keep uh, just keep hitting that button there, Jared. Uh, you know, it do, doesn't work. This is the question. Does it work? And now here's a picture. We'll go back. We go back to that thermal picture, please. The uh, thermal picture here. Now look at this. This is taken on. Uh, this is uh, 228 after we sealed it. After they've done their work, and you can tell, you know, what's leaking, what's not leaking. So does all this stuff we're doing work? Look at this. Look at this house next door and look at how much heat is transferring to the outside wow. and look at how little is transferring here. Most importantly to the right, look at this one on the right. You know, the 1940 style semi on the right hand side here is not, it's just absolutely glowing through the wall, which means you're getting uh, heat, incredible heat loss. So, yes, all this stuff we're doing works. So, we just keep going through the slides, please, Jared. Um, and we did this, uh, just hit them all up there. Yeah, the labor time study to achieve one and a half air changes per hour at 50. So we took a, a large production builder who builds energy start homes, roughly 2000. We followed and tracked what he was doing this uh, for, for six months study. And we tallied the labor and the material, you know, of what was used in his current traditional methodology. And we, we realized by studying this over the, the six months that they were putting in 16 additional hours across three sites at $55 per hour. It's $880 right there that they didn't have to do. You know, Jared talked earlier about, you know, man hours and he talked about materials and caulking foam and tape per house of about nine nine fifty turned out to be 1,050 for townhomes because of the party wall. You know, the site super time concerned, worry, crossing his fingers, you know, was that three hours, four hours, that sort of thing. So we feel that there's an estimated savings of approximately $1,500 to $2,500. I'm gonna say these are in Canadian um, uh, funds. So you can take that down a little bit for the US uh, that a builder can do if he uses Aerobar to still achieve that one and a half. There's a beautiful trade-off there. And you, you can see in this garage, we, we talked earlier about the, the spray foam. This is, a, a, the other thing about Aeroberry, it, we found out is a great diagnostic tool. Up in this corner, it was blowing out and it's just because they didn't hit the foam properly. So there's a lot of you know benefits to that. We'll go to the next one, the, the labor study. So optimizing the trade-offs as well. So, you know, this is really, really critical. As we said before, you start with uh, air tightness and you're like, okay, what can I do? Can I reduce my exterior insulation? Can I, you know, right size my insulation on the inside? Drain water heat recovery for, for Canada, $600. Nobody really knows the effect. It's a great trade-off. Triple pane windows, they're, they're heavy. Uh, they have a tendency to sag at, at times, you know, the hard on the software, you know, you could bring that back to, to double glaze with a nice uh, low E and save $1,000. And then removing party wall uh, ceiling, we've done, um, we're able to show in houses that we can seal them up with the drywall approach with aero barrier and get them to seal 100%, you can save $700. These are just different trade-offs that are in the buffet that are available to a builder, um, you know, that could be recommended by an energy advisor that a builder can trade off to pay for aero barrier and still get a better effect in terms of air change uh, per hour. Next slide. All so, right. You got it? Yep, yep. <laughs> So uh, th basically everything that, that wraps up into this is really allowing the contractor to take control of the process, right? So uh, and this is a process that uh, has an average of 22 contractors or workers that are involved uh, in, uh, uh, you know, throughout the process um, into one single step, right? Uh, so it's going to it's gonna allow uh, installers and contractors here to easily work around other trades with no downtime. The prep, the, uh, prepping the surfaces while other trades are in there, it's no issue. Shutting down the project site for a couple of hours during the seal process and then right back in in as little as 30 minutes to resume operations after that. So uh, that's that's a, um, a quick and dirty of what <laughs> Scott just went through. But uh, uh, I like the simplification of it because uh, it really does provide uh, exactly that simplification. We talk about optimization and uh, continuing to deliver at or above the performance for less. And um, uh, that all, obviously, it's, as we've been saying all through this, it's all gonna be depending on that air changes per hour. But before COVID, there's builders and con uh, contractors use aero barrier to really increase that efficiency and lower the labor costs, less material waste and everything we've been talking about. There's also the ability to rethink the insulation packages, rethink the, uh, uh, the framing materials, 
to streamline the air sealing process by turning you know, multiple steps into the single step. And then the ability to define the thermal envelope without cost implications pre or post drywall. So that's uh, that's something that's you know very important as well. But knowing knowing that your uh, your air changes are going to provide more accurate uh, uh, upfront energy modeling, uh, you're going to know what the target is. You're going to have the confidence to be able to hit it. Again, that peace of mind they're sleeping at night knowing that the prime was met there the first time. It is uh, it is something that also allows you to then turn and go and do more work. So uh, the increased uh, building costs here, um, the innovate and save approach after COVID, we know that uh, building materials everywhere have gone up. So where we were talking about rethinking the uh, size of the lumber, stud spacing, increase of, you know, that is uh, an increase of the cost of lumber and the materials. It's seen sometimes, depending on the size of the home, obviously, but uh, $15,000 uh, US uh, can be added to a single build. So uh, controlling the air tightness affords the opportunity to downsize that that thickness and still deliver that quality. And that's really the big the big component here, or the big uh, overall uh, achievement is that uh, maintaining the quality of the build with less costly materials. Again, same thing here with the insulation package. Enhance the benefits of, of spray foam uh, or uh, any other type of uh, insulation material by reducing that air leakage. It'll perform better. Everything will perform better with that. Uh, reduce the schedule conflicts we talked about uh, earlier there. That's really, uh, uh, you know, there's no more go backs, there's no more redos. It's a guaranteed uh, process that before leaving the job site, it'll be certified, verified where that leakage ends up. And, um, you know, uh, th that's going to be that um, the the next up, the next home up, uh, moving on to uh, to get that completed. And then right sizing the mechanicals, Scott touched on a little bit. You know, we know that getting it more efficient overall, it can take a half ton or a ton off of an uh, uh, an air conditioner uh, unit, and that can mean a thousand dollars or more. The overall impact here, so added revenue stream for a contractor business is going to be able to um, obviously add more revenue to it because you can do more work. Uh, but growing the company sustainably with uh, with more staff, but but also understanding that um, this is going to take minimal labor resources, right? So it's not something that has to necessarily be uh, staffed up for. Um, and with labor shortages being ever increasing. Uh, this is a this is a way to help combat that. You can add a consistent um, workflow to complement the other operations, and then with it being a new technology, it kind of gives that competitive edge. That's why a lot of our dealers have found that they can be the experts. They can become the champion of, of air sealing in their area. They're the go-to. And to Scott's example of the uh, uh, the flat uh, where over the time period of construction and build uh, and uh, being able, the crew being able to get it down to 1.61 and then with Aeroberry coming in and it, and it taking it down uh, below one air change. Uh, that could have been done right from the beginning and, and uh, it doesn't have to always be the reactive approach to solving a problem like that. It should be and it could be the, the proactive approach of let's just seal it right uh, with Aeroberry up front. You can differentiate with, with this as an add-on service, so no matter what you're doing, if uh, you're an ins insulation contractor or a raider, this makes for a good complement to what you're already doing. It's the foot in the door here, so you can establish the network and the brand in the market, and you can be ahead of the curve on the air tightness. So insulation contractors, it's, it's, uh, it's more project volume for you without having to go out and find a different customer base. And for energy raters, you, you get to strengthen that uh, relationship there by offering this other service. Not just identifying problems, but you're able to uh, fix them as well. So getting started with Aero Bearer, what's included in the total package, Scott described a little bit. So it's a modified blower door. The air nozzle uh, stands that are set up throughout the space. The Aero Barrier machine itself. A seven by 14 foot box trailer. We can also configure into box trucks. Uh, you know, so depends on, uh, you know, some people like the dedicated resource and where parking may be uh, 
uh, maybe a little bit more difficult, we can certainly do that. But uh, it also come with a compressor, uh, as the system does use that compressed air source. All of the other equipment, the laptop, and then a power or generator for that good clean power source there. So everything is all in this uh, mobile workspace for uh, for Aero Barrier. All right, so pricing strategies and, and the business opportunities. So how how many seals per day? I hope, I hope I'm not stealing someone's question for the Q&A later, but but it does come up a lot where uh, they, they want to know. So, uh, you know, you can do up to three seals per day. And, um, you know, that is uh, something that is probably not going to be able to be achieved any other way by sealing by hand. Um, so this is, uh, this is really key. If you've got volume work especially, uh, and there's the quality of the build or the code that is going to drive the need for hitting a high efficiency and uh, moving on to the next and without any go backs, without any callbacks and going back. This is uh, this will be an uh, extremely good way to go. So uh, how is it typically sold? So getting builders on board is a key part, right? So uh, they're obviously going to want to understand what's in the build, uh, but it's also going to be uh, that educational component around how it's going to help the, the existing building materials that they have or provide a means for them to rethink that wall package, the framing package, the insulation package to uh, be able to save on costs and uh, still provide that high quality build. So, uh, you know, I guarantee they'll be interested uh, around uh, hearing more about it. And, you know, we've also got some assistance here that we can help uh, with uh, the Aero Barrier team uh, making that connection uh, and, and the understanding to the builder is key, and we do that a lot here, and we're happy to, to also help with that. So this is a, an uh, actual example here with uh, Pacific Aero Barrier, and Scott, you want to uh, talk about this particular one? Yeah, I can. So th this is a, a project that we uh, secured out in uh, the lower mainland of uh, Vancouver, or BC in Vancouver, and they they managed to do six units in one day, which was incredible. They used a couple of machines, but look at the results they have on each one. You know, under one for almost everyone. There were two that were a little bit uh, higher. Um, you know, it worked really well. And you you said it there, uh, Jared. There's no other way that you can get this type of result. Uh, this quickly and it's interesting from a builder perspective of like you know uh, and Ian uh, he was the guy that runs uh, Pacific Air Bear you know at first when you show up on, on site you know builders there may be some reluctance they're not sure but when they know that within three or four hours that you can take their their unit from three air changes per hour or four four and a half five hours uh, air changes per hour down to one inch uh, air change per hour it changes the whole dynamic all of a sudden you know when you show when you get there there's a place for you to park they're ready for you because it's that beneficial to to the builder and that's what you know kind of Ian is finding on this project is when they're when they're ready they call him and he comes in and does uh, you know six at a time so it's a 107 unit project but you know there, there's that and the other thing I wanted to add you talked about getting started with Aero Barrier Jared and mm -hmm. I remember the very first job that we did uh, here in Canada we it was two passive houses in one day and we drove out into a forest that these people did not want to be found we opened up the gate the only thing we added was water and sealant were the only two things other than that the entire rig is comprehensive so it has everything you need to do a job. And I think that's really important for, for people looking at this, uh, for dealers, uh, potential dealers, to, to make sure that they know that they're getting everything they need to seal a job. And when we got on that job site, there was no power. So, you know, we brought our own power. As you said, we have our own compressor. We have our own air. Everything you need is in that trailer. Awesome. So here's, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've got just about seven minutes and we want to leave some time here for, uh, for Q&A, but I do want to, uh, want to share. There's a lot that we, that we shared here. There's so much more that we didn't uh, just because of the time constraint. And uh, the big thing here is how does it fit with the individual contractors with you, right? How does it work with your, your numbers, with your builds, with your builders, and all that, and that's something that I think we can only do on a on a one on one basis. And we do that all the time uh, with contractors. Again, we can engage with builders uh, if you want to bring them along and have the discussion as well. But you know, Scott, I want to invite you to let's take the next steps here, set up some time to meet and discuss where we can run through 
uh, an actual business model breakdown for you. We can talk about, um, you know, with the uh, Canada and U.S. specific with leasing and finance, financing options available for you to, you know, as a component of your consideration. Um, and then the government program eligibility, both again with uh, that are Canada and U.S. specific. Um, but we want to provide everything to you in that discussion that's going to allow you to decide if this is going to be something that you find will complement uh, what you're currently doing that can help you grow your business that can help you achieve those efficiency targets and that can really i mean it has a way of strengthening the builder relationship by just being uh you, you know so much more reliable in terms of uh, meeting the code or the energy target so uh, that's what um you know that's what we we feel like we, we the next step it makes some uh, the sense right sense for the next steps our contact information scott's there on the uh, on the left for canada uh, mine on the right and um, uh, we can uh, go to the q a yeah thank you guys can you hear me all right we can yep so thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jared. So we do have some questions that did trickle in. So we'll get to those right. again with uh, time and everything. Um, I do want to say one, it sounded like Joe earlier, we hit on the, the, the risk you take by how many contractors are involved in this process and how it goes forward. And Joe put the comment as a quote, failures occur at transitions dot, dot, dot of responsibility. That was not my scope where contractors kind of lose sight of what their responsibility is and play that blame game. So that was nice to hear as a mm. kind of a reconfirming it. Um, yeah. I think this is one of the common questions. I'll let both of you guys go about it, but can the product work on an existing occupied home? Yeah, it, it definitely can. Um, there's some challenges, right? So the finishings that are, that are gonna be there are gonna have to be, everything first of all has to be removed. Uh, all clothing, all furniture, all belongings, um, and the prep work is going to be a, a bit more uh, behind what uh, a new construction home would be. We do have contractors that are doing this uh, and have done this, um, but uh, the, absolutely it can be done. Ideally, it's at a gut renovation level or something like that, um, just because of the setup and the process uh, to prep, but it can be. It's not widely being done that way, but it can be. All right, we have a question from Elizabeth. Uh, this is stress tested with no signs of degradation. That's great. Over what time frame is the no degradation sustained? After 10 years, 20 years, settling occurs over time. How does this hold up against settling? Um, yeah, there's there's still, uh, we, we have the 40 year stress test uh, that uh, Scott mentioned in there. There's still some uh, some work to be done on what at what point does it degrade I, I, we don't have a determination point on it um it is something you know as we look at sealant uh the chemical uh, makeup of it and uh you know where we landed on on this being something that we feel is is uh, uh is, you know, very durable um I, we don't have a good determination on it but uh what did you say the name was uh, that had that question? Uh, elizabeth elizabeth okay We'll get a we'll get a follow up on it. Um, let's see if I can get you any better information on that. You know the the material itself is uh, you know when it when it cures it's going to be uh, semi rigid. You know so it's going to it's going to it's going to be durable. It's um, let's say it's as as uh, durable or as uh, uh, like a construction adhesive. But uh, once it's in place uh, to remove it, it's it's not going to be very easy. So flexing of the house and things like that, that would happen, you know, as, as the house would settle, um, you know, there's, there's no doubt that there could be some, uh, some long-term effect, but as far as you see that picture where that ceiling got into the shim pack uh, that Scott showed, um, there's no other adhesive that, or I'm sorry, there's no other sealant that's going to be getting into uh, that level. And so, we look at it as it's definitely going to be better. The house is going to settle no matter what, and aero barrier is going to have the the longer, better result on it. But a good, clear determination. I, I wish we had something. 
Can I just add uh, under that, Jared? So Elizabeth, we, we had that question at the beginning as well. One, the material, it sticks to like 41 different types of construction materials. And once it's on, like it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's on there. Uh, but we went back and tested two of the houses that we did in our first year. We tested them about a year and a half after. And the lower door number was exactly the same in both of them. So we're watching a couple of houses over time to, to see that. And so far after, let's we'll say two years, we have seen no degradation in a real life experience. So we feel really comfortable with the material that we have. Uh, it's adhesive properties. We also feel really comfortable and confident in our uh, accelerated age testing. And now we're starting to see uh, data that is showing us that it is holding up in an actual situation. Um. AJ would like to know how big of a square footage the one rig can handle. Um, so what are what are the restrictions? What are the constraints? How big of a space can Aero Barrier seal up to? So it, it'll depend on on how leaky it is, right? So uh, there have been large commercial spaces that have have been uh, have been sealed, and it's really whatever whatever needs to be done to pressurize the space. So if there's an additional blower door. Uh, you know, additional pressur pressurization. We can we can certainly adapt to be able to do that. So there is no real limit. It's uh, on the size of the space. It's really on being able to pressurize it. So if it's again, I, com compartmentalized or something like that, then then uh, on a, again we're talking commercial space. Then it uh, you know that's what may have to be done if it's a extremely large space. But additional blower doors should be able to help. And Jared, I'll add, we, we did a job here in the Toronto area that was, uh, in, in terms of size, it was about 260,000 cubic feet. And we used two systems because of what you're saying, just to get yeah. the pressurization. And we used approximately 12 spray nozzles. So in the capacity, you know, is 16. Yes. So that's, that's what we use. And we sealed that building to uh, 0.93 ACH 50. Nice. Very nice. Yep. My understanding, I, I don't know if it helps them or anything, but 7,500, 8,000 square feet is pretty typical or at least a safe bet on some of these numbers um, with one rig at least. But to Jared's point, you're talking about tighter homes, obviously it's going to be easier than something that starts at 19 ACH. Um, Ryan in here has a couple questions. So firstly, uh, he's asking, what is the cost of the rig? Um, and I know this one differs between the Canadian market and the U.S. market. Um, he would also like to know, uh, are there any national, large, regional builders currently using Aero Barrier? And are there any temperature constraints? Okay. So, uh, making sure here, cost, <laughs> national builders, and temperatures. Yep. Okay. So uh, the, the cost of the trailer is uh, it starts out at sixty thousand uh, sixty thousand dollars US, and um, you know we can get into uh, if you're interested in, in the details behind uh, you know the components of that and everything we're we're happy to do that uh, one on one here. So um, put a comment in if if you'd like for us to reach out. But um, you know that's uh, that's the startup get you started with uh, with some sealant as well. Um, national builders we do have. Um, uh, we do have a few, you know, there's there's some that are, uh, Mandalay Homes is using um, uh, using Aero Barrier um, on uh, on a number of their homes. Um, you know, the DR Hortons of the world, the Pultes, I know that we've, we've done some work for them um, regionally. We haven't done work, uh, you know, as far as a national fit for them yet. So we'll leave that out there because that's, that's obviously... Uh, you know, for uh, for them to uh, work it into uh, all aspects of their of their builds everywhere. That's our ultimate goal, and, and if we're able to do that, then that provides a lot of opportunity for contractors like you. Uh, and then temperature-wise, so the the system does have a heater that's built in uh, because it will. Uh, there is some need to make sure that the space is uh, uh, you know is uh, is heated uh, adequately but what we you know during the winter months um typically it's going to be installed after drywall so there would be heat uh it would be heated uh somewhat to you know at that stage of the build uh but the heater is going to uh, take that liquid sealant and it helps to dry it out make it light and then have the sealant perform the way that it's supposed to 
So uh, there's not, um, I mean, unless it were to get down into negatives, uh, Scott, maybe maybe you've got a little bit more beat on that on the um, uh, Canadian uh, side. I know you guys have much, uh, you know, much more cold uh, examples. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. Uh, national builders, just so I put it out, we don't have a lot of national builders in Canada, but we do work for Minto. We also do work for Mattamy, who is the largest privately held builder in, in North America. So we are working on a, on a kind of a national schedule. We, all, uh, we also work with a Habitat uh, for Humanity right across Canada. We, we consider them a, a, a kind of a national brand. So we're getting a lot of airplay from, uh, it comes there national or large companies that are even or more more regional. In terms of the, uh, the winter, it's uh, the process, it's all about, you know, controlling the uh, the temperature and as Jared says there's a, a heater on there uh, in colder temperatures we do need some auxiliary heat as well but it's very easily easily done to put that in into the house so it's uh, you know we've developed a system for cold weather um, uh, seals uh, Doug Doug has a couple he may have a question and a statement but he's looking at the builder as the the end user as he should be uh, at what point in the build do you perform the aero barrier? Is it after drywall, before, and what's the typical cost for about a 3,000 square foot home? Um, which I think the 3,000 square foot home, from my understanding, you might need to break that up based on what that application is in the build process or when they start it. So, uh, Scott, maybe you can speak to that one. Yeah, and typically you can, uh, you know, you can seal the house as soon as you can pressurize it. We used to, you know, we say a lot after first mud, um, but we also have to be clear with the builder because we have had one where we said, oh, we come in after mud, we get there, there are no windows. So what we need to do is we need to be able to pressurize the house and we need to have the air barrier installed. That's really critical. So if you're doing an exterior air barrier, which we're seeing a lot more of right across the you know, North America, you can go in early um, in, you can also go to uh, first mud, even first prime, and we've gone even a little bit further. So there's a little bit, there's a nice range in there so you can fit into the builder schedule and there's a way to work with the builder. So there's some flexibility be, flexibility on when you show up and when you can actually do the seal, but to keep in mind, it's when you can pressurize the house. Which that one brings us to another point uh, Ryan's making. So. I think this is kind of the beauty of aero barrier being uh, self-guided and everything, but he's saying he's seen applications after drywall. Wouldn't this leave uncontrolled air leakage within the wall cavity? No. So what we've seen, because there's, you're at 100 pascal, so that's like a, a 80 kilometer, 50 mile per hour wind that's going into the house. And so that sealant is traveling through, it actually goes past the, the drywall and to the point where the velocity picks up in the air barrier. I have some pictures, I didn't show them today, I'd be more than happy to share them with you, where I've, I've been on site and I've seen houses that have drywall, poly, two by sixes, they're insulated, and two inches of Owens Corning foam on the outside that's gasketed and tape. And I actually have pictures of the sealant that has come to the outside and then it stops once the hole is sealed. So um, it, it gets to that, that, that furthest point in that air barrier as well, just with the pressure. Uh, so Doug would like to know, he's moving uh, the construction company to Texas within the next year. Is there an air barrier installer in Northwest Texas? I, I don't believe there's anybody covering the area. Uh, but again, we can. Uh, I can pull up the map, um, and uh, we can we can have a specific conversation on it. So I'll note here, Doug, uh, if you want to share the contact info uh, there, I'm happy to uh, to reach out. We can we can talk on that. Yeah, and this one kind of beats that same competition. Ross is kind of curious. What's the competition like? And I, I think that brings us back to that slide where. It's a new technology. Um, I mean, new relative to a few years at this point, but it's still the opportunity is pretty open. So I'll let you guys speak as the what you're seeing in the markets. What is that competition like? Uh, competition, as in uh, sealing by hand <clears throat> or sealing by uh, using a uh, foam. Um, it again, it's uh, most of those other applications is uh, being able to get uh, to get the sealant where it needs to go, and uh, that goes to that 
that person or people that are responsible, uh, quote unquote, responsible to, to get it there. As we talked about so many different people that, that are currently involved in or responsible for that, uh, for sealing it. But um, arrow barrier is indiscriminate. It doesn't care. It's going to go to wherever those uh, those leak points are. So, uh, you know, it doesn't require someone to see the, the gap to respond and fill the gap. It'll, it, you know, it's it's just by the the physics of it, it's going to go there. So, uh, I, you know, we look at, you know, we understand there is competition out there as far as other methods, um, but to the level of doing this with the science behind it and verifying the results, there's really nothing that combines those aspects. Now, if I add to that, Jared, you know, this is a patented process, so yeah. we're really competing against traditional methodology, and that's what I really wanted to show you in that slide with that uh, renovation that they were doing of, you know, we, with Aeroberry, you just, uh, you know, kick everybody's butt because you can do that. What you can do in four hours, guys can't do in weeks and with lots of material. So in terms of the competition right now, I, I don't look at it in terms of competition. I look in terms of market development. Um, yeah. You know, this is a big need in the in the builder market. Air, you know, sealing up the houses, it's one of the most complex things to do. Houses are bigger. There's more angles. They're more com complex and harder to seal. And Aero Barrier does this through a self-guided uh, process. So I look at it more as how do we develop the, the market? And we're doing that by strategically locating dealers across the country to, to service uh, builders and renovators. And so again, go back, not really a competition thing per se, because I, I, we just, you know, we can beat traditional methods so easily um, and we are very cost effective as well and we do need to talk about that specifically with each each individual dealer or builder because it all depends yeah. on volume all depends how, how leaky it is so i really look at this as a market development um i know but when i sold hrvs years ago it was very similar it was more about market development than, than traditional type of competition i hope that helps yeah. Yeah. The uh, so the competition, uh, real quick, Scott. Your your slide uh, of the uh, the construction process on the flat home that uh, that you're showing, and then you showed the thermal image afterwards. The competition was all of those stages along the, uh, on that timeline that you showed. That I mean, that's that's really those competing methods, I should say, right? Um, and then to be able to come in with arrow barrier, uh, the non-traditional and uh, deliver the uh, you know below uh one air change is uh, i think that that's a that it's one of the best slides that i've seen and i haven't seen that one yet uh so thank you for sharing it but that that i think drives on what those tra traditional methods and then what arrow barrier can deliver correct great. great and then as an just an additional point in case um what does the competition look like in terms of right now getting involved as an arrow barrier dealer how many contractors are we talking about are there certain markets that are you know off the off the playing field because we already have people there what does that look like yeah so the uh, there are some markets where we uh we have uh, a number of contractors where uh, it's all based on the number of home starts so we look at one system, one machine uh, for every 1,000 new home starts uh, as, a, as that guideline. So, uh, you know, looking at individual markets like that, uh, we can give a pretty, pretty good and easy uh, 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 evaluation of is this open and then, uh, you know, what would it take to get you started? We're happy to do that. Uh, so we have... Looking at a scheduling point at what is the best point? I know we covered that a little bit. Do you, do you guys see any preferences on what point is most efficient in terms of it, or is it all just dependent on you know, when, when the builder says, hey, the air ceiling can begin, let's go? So I'll, I'll just add to that. So we, I find that after uh, first mud is great. One of the nice things about once the drywall's on, it clamps your poly in place. If you're using poly or any of your, you know, your black death, your acoustical caulking, so you get a better clamp. You've already got a good seal. And now we really get to go after smaller type holes where arrow barrier is super at. You know, there's nothing that can get those small holes like arrow barrier. So we really want to build a good house to be able to. We want to do all that large hole remediation up up front, and then we want it. The drywall on really helps to to clamp it. 
or if it's a good exterior insulation like an Owens Corning or DuPont where it's already gasketed and taped or even a zip panel, then sure. you're looking at small holes and you can do it at that point in time. But I really like the uh, the drywall approach after first mud. Also for heat, particularly in, in Canada where it's colder, we can control the inside uh, humidity and temperature uh, easier. I think we touched on this one a little bit in, but maybe we can reiterate it. Elizabeth uh, has some follow-up questions as well. One of those being around, it looks like a cost savings, what they can offer back to their builders and everything from still providing that same level of performance, but with less costly material, uh, still quality material, but just less costly. So the, the question is, if a builder is using two by six framing with three inches of fr uh, foam in the walls, and five inches in the ceiling, could the contractor maintain that same level of efficiency by going to two by four with two inch frame or spray foam, for instance? Scott, you wanna? Yeah, I, I will. Yeah, so so Elizabeth and and every everybody else. So I would look at that as a kind of you would need to model your house depending on the air change uh, starting. I know in Canada you're going to be uh, with two by by six. You could change from to from a 16 inch center to a 24 inch center, which is going to save you lumber as well. And as uh, Jared pointed out, you know, with COVID and the additional cost of COVID, that makes a big difference. You know, right now to changing that and reducing the lumber. So I would look at that as um, something we should be doing individually with each energy advisor and to do that optimization, optimization up front. The, the difference now though, is you know what your air changes per hour are. So you can actually dial in all of the other elements of the build. We have, uh, Mitch is asking, I think this is another one of those common FAQs. Uh, how close are the results from the aero barrier test as far as ACH and the final blower door test? Um, they're assuming that it doesn't quite take the uh, the blower door, the actual test. And I know, I, I think I've heard rumblings that some states are starting to, you know, consider adopting what our results are and a lot of energy raters and others that you get involved with. But I'll let you guys speak more to what is that difference in terms of our blower door from an aero barrier versus an official certified uh, blower door test? I don't, I don't have a, a percentage difference, but there are, you know, in part of the prep um, in sealing with aero barrier, you're going to be masking off the mechanical openings, and, you know, the doors, the windows, and and whatnot. So there's, uh, there is that aspect where it's, it's going to be tested with uh, the post seal test. You know, the end results of the aero barrier test will have that uh, factored in, and then uh, blower door tests afterwards will not. So I, Scott, I don't know if you've seen a uh, have a, a rule of thumb percentage or anything that you guys have seen. Yeah, there's no rule of thumb percentage, and you, you kind of hit it there. We have to yeah. tape off the intentional openings, as we talked about that in the in the prepping. So when you go to do a pushing and pulling, are going to be different. So once you yeah. take off that protective uh, tape. Uh, let's say on a bath fan, that bath fan is going to leak. So I can't give you a percentage because some houses may have seven bath fans, some may have one, some may be fully ducted with their, their HRV. Some HRVs may leak more than others. Some hot water heaters may leak more than others. But we did we did have this on, on a house early on and we did realize that there's a difference. And there's also a difference in the blower door technology itself. Each blower door, each day, the pressure is going to be different, temperature is going to be different, could give you a slight different reading. But mm -hmm. what I do know is when I test it the same, like if it's pressurized to pressurize, then what will end up happening is it's going to be very similar. So I know that the envelope yeah. is tight. But the mechanicals account for, let's take a bath fan. We measured this on one house. It, each bath fan, and these are good bath fans too, were leaking at 12 CFM per, and the house had seven of these uh, uh, fans in it, and the HRV was leaking at about 25 CFM and the hot water was about 30 CFM. Well, we had brought the house down to less than 100 CFM. So you can see that there's going to be a difference, but it was all in the mechanical. We taped off the mechanical, we did pressurization, the envelope was exactly the same. So it really comes down to the mechanicals. Um, I think this is a really important one that I, I know we talked a little bit about the, the business opportunity, what all is involved in it. But that training side, the upfront, like if somebody comes on, becomes one, we're not necessarily throwing them to the wolves. I know there's some training involved, there's some collateral, there's a lot of support for building out your builder network and everything, but 
Uh, Jared, Scott, each of you have different markets. Do you want to speak to what that initial piece looks when somebody comes on, walk through kind of that that life cycle with them? Yeah, so the initial uh, the initial training is going to be the technical training, um, which is three days, and it's included with uh, uh, with the package, right? We, the big thing is this is not a this is a partnership. This isn't a, a sale. <laughs> this is a we want you set up uh, to be able to perform and and succeed. So that first day is going to be really uh, uh, discussion around uh, around the system, around uh, uh, the approach and the setup. The, the next two days are going to be hands on, you know, with a home and and uh, performing seals. So you know there is some timing around uh, where we talk about when is it the right time uh to uh, to be able to do a seal so there there's some timing around that technical training to make sure that the home is going to be in the right stage and um uh that way that uh you know time isn't going to be wasted and and uh, we, we did have a training i think one time scott mentioned it where uh it was after first uh, first coat of mud but there were no windows and uh so then there was some some uh, uh you know plan b options which are not ideal uh to try to uh, uh you know, cover up the uh, uh, the windows or the openings for the windows. So we uh, we definitely want to make sure that that's timed right. But um, the ongoing support that we have here with the Aero Barrier team, uh, it's both here in the U.S. and, and Scott's team, and, and you can uh, talk more uh, there, Scott, around uh, supporting uh, Canadian dealers. But uh, you know, we want to be here to to help with the ongoing effort. You know, this is only going to be successful. Uh, for the individual contractors, or for us, if it's uh, aligned with the individual's contractor success. So, you know, again, it's it's a partnership, and that's actually uh, the way that we, we refer to the dealers as dealer partners. Yeah. And I, I would just add to that, and, and we use the same, the same protocol, so it's a three-day training, um, but your success is our success. That's that's the mode that we do. Uh, I can tell you, so on the first day, it's all that theoretical. It's kind of, you know, how it all works, all the contents of the of the machine, of the trailer. And then the second day is on site and your qualified technician will be there to show your team how to do everything. They show everything. It's very instructional. It's like, do this, do that. We go through it very, you know, slowly, methodically, so you understand all the pieces. And then uh, day three is we get you to seal a house as well. So you need to have two houses ready to seal. But the difference between day two and day three is now the crew has to do your crew would do the seal and the qualified uh, trainer would stand back and he would just kind of involve you and then correct you. So by time the end of the, the three days, and it's very self-explanatory as well. Everything kind of once you once you understand how to set it up and it's not really difficult at all, the the computer kind of runs the process itself. So it's uh it, it really works well, really simple, but it's the same process. But most importantly, what I think Jared said was it's that back end support. At the end of three days, we don't go away. We're we're partners and we we want to be here and doing this forever. So we're we're here to support everybody on ongoing. Yeah, the dealer network is very close too. So, you know, a lot of uh, uh, your struggles are not always going to be just your struggles. Your successes won't just be the same successes. You'll be able to share that across the, the dealer network. You know, if it's just something if, uh, in prep work or something like that on conference calls and things with other dealers that are doing the same thing, maybe in a different area. Uh, but that sharing of knowledge, uh, it, really, it really makes it so that you don't have to uh, you don't have to learn everything yourself. You can hear from other people, especially ones that have been doing it much longer. Great. I'll try to wrap up. We have a couple more. Um, Jared, a couple of questions are in here just to see if they can get your guys' contact. So I would just recommend we go back one slide while we close this out. Yeah. Um, so Joe, Joe's asking the, the million dollar question. I feel like we get this all the time on social media and we get it everywhere. So are we going to talk about ventilation? Um, I know Scott, you touched a little bit on it. You know, build it tight, ventilate it right. But this whole concept around tight homes immediately equals bad IAQ. Um, how we approach that? What are the thoughts, the reservations? I know where I stand on it, but I'll let you guys talk more to it. I would yeah. never live in a house without balanced ventilation. So, you know, I, I look back to when I first started in the building industry in the in the 80s. If you had a, a window in your bathroom, you didn't need a bath fan. 
you know, and we graduated to a bath then in your, in, you know, uh, get away from the window in your, in your bathroom. And then we understood that we needed balanced ventilation. So for me, it's, it's really simple in Canada. It's in the code. I'm going to say 95% of most new houses have a balanced HRV or ERV. Um, if, if anybody out there wants to talk about that specifically, um, feel free to take a picture of that, of my contact information. Um, you know, we can find the people in your area that to talk about that ventilation we really are on the envelope ceiling side we know that once we tighten it up we need to use ventilation we're not the specific experts on this i do have some knowledge on it but if you wanted to reach out to me like i say take a picture of my email or, or call me on my cell phone and i would gladly help and direct you to the right person in your local area yeah that, that's that's i think it's a well answered question scott the same thing you know we we do believe that the tighter that it goes you know it is it is everything should be designed you know from from how tight the home should be to the ventilation so uh getting again getting to the the, the experts on that that's uh that's who we would rely on and then uh lastly so can this be a standalone business? Um, it seems that you guys are pitching it as an add-on to an existing subcontractor model, but could it be a standalone business? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the reason why we pitch it as the add-on um, is because um, it's it's going to be the easiest to get to get going with your existing network. So your builder connections, uh, uh, you know, are going to be the way to go if you're starting from scratch um you know the uh, you're breaking in you're competing against not just you know uh, the legacy ways of, of air sealing you're competing against a lot a lot more than that so uh you know we believe that uh, there has to be some some knowledge of some an understanding of how the, the the home operates as a system um I, it kind of depends on what that background is I, I i'll leave it open but but typically we don't uh, it's not that startup business with somebody that um uh you know that wants to uh that loves it as the technology and wants to break in um we really believe that it's it's best served if there are there's a network there uh connections to be able to leverage it if I could just add into that, uh, Jerry, you know, in Canada a couple of years ago, there were zero. So, you know, we had originally wanted to be the dealer developer, kind of the agent of this whole thing in Canada. But we realized quickly that builders and uh, potential dealers wanted to see it. So we brought a machine in, we started up at the dealership and it is standalone. We now have separated that from our company. We have uh, three guys that run that and it is standalone. So it is possible. And I would say that in a few years, Jared, as we go towards, particularly in Canada, it doesn't matter, it, near, net zero is already uh, houses. Um, these are, this is gonna be a standalone business. But to your point, Jared, if it, you can bolt it onto another business, that's just another great opportunity. Uh, the other side is, you know, you could start as an independent and bolt on other stuff to that business and you could become the air ceiling experts of the house so there are two ways to look at it but uh, I have we have three or four guys here in Canada that are standalone and then we have approximately uh, 12 or 13 that are have it as bolt-on great all right last question because it looks like we have uh, a possible international uh, viewer that joined us so thank you for joining us uh, so when will Aero Barrier be available in Europe I think that's one of our questions we we usually get along the line. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it is. Um, it's something that you know, as far as being able to support it, we want to make sure that when uh, when we do bring someone on, that it's not you know that partnership is very important to us, and and being able to support that partnership uh, uh, is really the key. So. You know, I don't. I don't think that there's a, a definite time. I know that we wanted to start looking at, uh, you know, planning for it in 2021. Um, so, you know, we do aero seal duct sealing internationally. Um, uh, you know, Europe, um, actually all over, about 16 different countries. But, um, you know, so we have a uh, we have a template to be able to do it again. It's just it's, it is different enough from the duct sealing uh, aspect to where we want to make sure. The support element is not is not something that uh, uh, you know that we fail on. So uh, look for it. Look for some uh, you know some uh, movement in that direction in 2021. 
again, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure who that came from, but we're happy to, uh, you know, to take your information and put it, put it in our, uh, <laughs> in our system as a, uh, as a reminder, because we're, we're going to be going in that direction, and the sooner, uh, sooner we can do that with partners, the better. Yeah. And Jared, I just add one thing. I know that our boss, Paul, is listening onto this call. And Paul, I'd just be happy to make the sales call for you somewhere in Europe. I'm okay with that. Let me know how I can help. <laughs> Going back to Spain, Scott. That's right. Uh, anyway, from Canadian side, I'd like to thank everybody. So uh, the, the, really appreciate it. If you have some calls uh, or information that you require, questions, for the questions, feel free uh, to reach out to me. Yeah, same thing. Uh, thank you all for uh, for your participation and, and hanging on here. Look forward to some uh, some future conversations and and uh, kind of getting that breakdown for you and, and your business. Uh, thank you, Scott. Really appreciate uh, everything um, on this, and then Billy as well. Thank you for setting this up. Thanks, thank you, guys. You. Yeah, thank you for joining. Sorry for holding us over. We. Uh... Yeah, we had some pretty good turnout, so everybody hung on. So lots of great questions, and I will let you everybody get back to their day, and uh, good luck out there. We hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you.